one thing is that, that I think I just want to make a comment not to this right now because I don't really fancy these birds so much. It's a beautiful bird. But Ken, Ken raised a, a good question about publishing bad uh, experience or experiments that didn't work out well. Uh, some years ago, way back actually, we had an international telemetry conference where we did, I was organizing it together with others, and we had one session said, experiment that went wrong. And we tried really to get papers into that. We managed to get have two. People were really reluctant to show the data because they were wrong. I think it was Finn Erkland who killed all his carp in Africa because it was too cold. And then it was me who killed all the very, very threatened spring salmon in one river by tagging them too early and they just all croaked. Uh, but we published these papers and uh, they've been cited quite a lot. So I think it's very important that you guys do it. I know that we are all afraid that, oh no, if our tagging uh, leads to mortality, we don't want to show it because then we get problems with animal welfare and so on. But in a way, we just uh, need to address these things, and we know there's a bias. Anyway, I'll get right on to my comment. Stuck. Um, so, migrating smolts is what we are talking about here. Uh, it's also other fish species, but I was trying to keep my focus on salmon. Uh, we have been working with a whole bunch of other fish, and of course, sea trout has been uh, an integrated part of all our work throughout the years. But I'll try to see if I can, uh, if I can sort that out a little bit here. So mainly I have three main stories. One is the, is the whole common conflict, not just in Denmark, but the whole one. Then I will tell you the little intriguing story about the Danish salmon. I could easily spend hours on that, but I'll try to get it down to half of my presentation. Then, of course, uh, the results of 18 years of these small predation studies. And then I want to talk about change of behavior of the, of the predators, which I think it's a crucial uh, thing to, to consider when you make these type of studies and, and conclude on it. And I'll, if I get time, I'll talk a little bit about management. And I got time enough because there's uh, the lunch break, so we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> so the, the fact that cormorant is a conflict species is, is, is not surprising to anybody. I don't have to, 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 uh, to try to persuade you of that. It's kind of going on everywhere. Here's an old uh, homepage I saw actually from the Angling Trust here, where you have to uh, report cormorants, and you see in German and Germany they have a common and a fish bestand and unendliche Geschichte, so that's a never-ending story, uh, and it really is a never-ending story. This was from nine, and it's still going on, and it's a high-profile conflict in in Germany, and it's a high-profile conflict in Finland nowadays, and in Sweden, and in Denmark too. So it's on the political agenda over and over again. I've been summoned to the Finnish parliament twice last year to, to come and talk to them about the common predation issue because they need to do something about it. Uh, and in US, like we're talking about the double-crested comrades, I was involved in this here too. Uh, in Com Columbia River, there's an artificial uh, sandbar where we have a lot of comrades. And, and, and lo and behold, the pit tagging showed that, that some of the comrades ate 3.6% of the of the juvenile uh, steelhead smalls. So, so that was terrible because 3.6% is not much, but that's 20 million uh, juveniles. So they say, we got to do something. And, and they actually went uh, in with the army and I was consulted by the army to tell them that how can we deal with this. And they went in at night with a silencer and a 22 caliber and they shot the whole bunch of them. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if it helped a lot, but boy, they got a lot of public hearing uh, replies that I looked through and that was fantastic. You know, those bird people were way up there and getting so angry about this. The thing is, the co those comrades were never there before. They just came because of this sandbar. Uh, so again, it's, 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 a, it's a not an invasive species, but in a way they act like they are. And that's uh, uh, kind of uh, typical for this story. Okay. So what is it? It's a conflict. And it's always, people always say it's a conflict between people. Yeah, sure it is. But here's a conservation of healthy comrade population. We all want, uh, well, not all, but most of us want comrades. We think they're great. Uh, I was always happy when I was younger to see cormorants on the coast. I thought it was a great f bird to watch. Uh, but, you know, healthy cormorant population, but we also need to have healthy fish stocks. And when we say healthy fish stocks, we, just, we don't need two or three salmon in each river. We would like to have harvestable fish stocks. So we should have fish enough for predators and anglers. I do this talk for a commercial fishermen too. I did many, many years back in the 90s, but now all the commercial fishermen in Denmark have gone bankrupt so, because there's no fish to catch on the coast. So they basically lost out. So I don't even put fishermen there anymore. Now it's only anglers who are uh, concerned about the fish. So let's see. There we have it. Uh, this is not very up to date, but you know, this is the situation. Here's the little, little country of Denmark. Here's Jewish land that I've been talking about that some of you didn't know, which surprised me a lot, but this is actually where, where we live. Uh, these are the 
bloody colonies, they're pretty much everywhere. Uh, we have about 250,000 birds in, uh, in the high season, that means Oct August, September. And in the winter time in spring, the minimum number is about down to 15,000. So as you can see, well, most of you know how small Denmark is, so it's quite a dense population of cormorants there. A lot of birds that need a lot of fish. So what has the development been? Well, just like everywhere else, they got protected here in 1980. We had very few pairs. Uh, then it really took off in the early uh, 90s, and then we leveled off at about 40,000 pairs. Uh, and then we had a decrease here due to reasons I'll come into, but basically food and, and, and cold weather, uh, food depletion, and then now we have a little bit more again. So in total numbers, uh, it, it doesn't look like it's so bad, and the, all the conservationists say, yeah, look, it's, it's leveled out and it's going down, so now you have no conflicts anymore. Uh, but of course, that's not the case. We have much more conflict now than ever. So the story brief here was that we got them here. Uh, the cormorants raised up in the 90s and traditional pound net fishing totally disappeared. As I said, when I started working with this, we had 800 commercial pound net fishermen. Now we got four left, maybe seven. It depends on what you talk about, full time or part time. Then all the coastal fish and fishing was heavily reduced. We just didn't see the fish along the coast anymore. Eel pout disappeared first, then all flounders caught and so on. So now it's basically empty out there. Uh, they, at that time, we had relatively few, but very large colonies of cormorants. Uh, they started to collapse then. Chick died, they were starved out. And now we have much more, but much smaller colonies. Uh, we got more, more birds coming in the winter. Before we didn't have overwintering bird much, but now we got lots from Sweden and Finland because they breed tons and tons of birds and maybe also because the winters tend to get milder, as you know. Uh, but in 2009-10 we had these cold, sh uh, harsh winters, two of them, and there we suddenly saw a change of behavior. These birds started to go inland and be less shy, and that's, uh, that's where all our problems as anglers started at least. Uh, and so in the recent years we have much more problems with rivers, brooks and lakes, and the situation now is that both grayling, resident trout and North Sea houting are in dire strait. They are really threatened by extinction because of uh, common predation. So, and there's quite a consensus about these things. Okay, so now I get directly to the smolts. Well, when we talk smolts, we have salmon smolts, we have trout smolts. We can also have wild smolts and hatchery smolts. We did studies on all these four groups. Uh, and the predation we see can be pre smolt or par in river predation. That hasn't been a big issue before. This is what we're studying now because that suddenly became a, a big question. Then we have this predation migrating smolt, which we have been studying since 1995, I think, with both radio tags and acoustic tags. So we started our acoustic studies with, with V7 and so on all way back in 2001. Uh, then we have, of course, predation on post smolts. So that's uh, again when you come out in the coast. So, but one question you all have, I guess, is do they really have any wild salmon in Denmark? We are not even part of NASCO or anything. Why, why, why does he, this stupid guy talk about salmon? It's probably just something they, they stocked in there. Actually, I put a photo of a, a, a hatchery salmon smolt here and a wild salmon smolt there just for fun. That was from, from Norway, but I just thought it was interesting that they think that when you tag these guys, they should represent these guys. But, so so I, I'm always in favor of looking at wild fish. We don't really want to mess too much with the hatchery fish. But, so the story of Denmark is, yes, we do have salmon. This was from a day a few years ago in Vada River, and you see these guys are pretty happy with the wild fish they got there. They were two 18 plus kilos caught in April. So how did that happen, that we suddenly have the salmon in Denmark? Well, we actually removed barriers. That's basically what we did. Uh, I can call it river restoration. Yes, we did put out gravel somewhere uh, for fun, or it, and it does help to get, give uh, new spawning areas, but this one is the one that really did the job for us. Uh, and of course, there was also a stop for coastal fishing. So our salmon population in Denmark have increased hundredfold over the last 20 years. So from having hardly any salmon, we ended up having a lot. This was what we saw in Denmark in general. We used to have a very nice salmon river here in Skan. We got data back from 100 years ago. They caught these, these are the registered caught fish in the estuary. So it's not a lot, you see 600 fish, but you see also at, in the 80s it went down. And since then, we actually thought that salmon in Denmark is a, is a history thing. They're just extinct and we were thinking there were about 50 individuals coming back every year in the whole country to spawn. And whether they were original or not was not something people were thinking too much about. So in, in, the, in the early 90s and up to 2000, lots of 
fish were imported from Boris Hul, Korib, Kong, Etran, Lagan, wherever, and put out to see if we could do some restoration of the salmon stocks. And, and of course, these fish did survive and come back, but they didn't do very well. So that was not a very good uh, story. But then we were lucky to have a box in the basement of the institute where we had some old scales, 100-year-old scales, from a bunch of these West Jutland rivers. They were from 1896 to 1916, I think, those scales. And our geneticist managed to get viable DNA out of those, so he could make a baseline and say, here's the DNA baseline for a Danish West Coast salmon. And we even saw there was difference between these rivers. Well, so what we did then was went into those rivers and caught very few of those 5, 10 salmon we could find every year. And lo and behold, there was still the original genetic composition and there was even a, a nice variation in them. So we thought, okay, we, we kick, kick out all these uh, foreign stockings and only base whatever we are going to stock on our own. We didn't really want to stock anything, but we had to do something. So the situation now in 1999 when we started this work was that the salmon was extinct here. Uh, extinct there, there, and there, and there, but we still had uh, stocks of original uh, West Jutland salmon coming back to these four rivers. So these four rivers are like the backbone in our work, and those are also the ones covered by our management plan. Okay, so what happened then? Well, you see, we started to put out original fish here. The way we did that, of course, is you go through a river, electrofish, take each and every fish up, the ones that are clearly like escaped hatchery fish or something you just throw out. But there are others we did a, a genetic test on each individual and only the ones that had the right genetic composition was put into the, to the breeding stock. So it took speed here and uh, we, at the same time we started removing all the dams. Hydropower stations went, all the fish farms went, uh, most of everything else also went out. So, so the rivers were ma mainly uh, <laughs> getting their connectivity back. And this is what happened. Here's just a catch. So now we're actually up on an annual run size of 14,000 uh, fish. Uh, the anglers catch about 40% of them, but keep only 10. So you can see there's quite a lot of catch and release going on. Uh, there's a very high proportion of multi-sea winter fish in our stocks. So on average, I, this is based on 5,600 salmon in my database randomly caught by electrofishing in the, in the autumn. The mean size is 78 centimeters. So they are really nice big fish. We don't get many grills and most of them are wild. We still have some fish coming back that are uh, fin clipped from the hatchery, but we release less and less fish. Two of the rivers are now uh, stopped any stocking at all because they all work, it all works fine. So that's the story of the Danish salmon. Just a little note from this year, we, there was a guy up in Holstebro. Uh, he got a one, uh, one meter and 41 centimeter salmon here in October last year. He did put it out again, as you see, but he was quite surprised to get that. He was actually standing on a parking lot just casting out a spinner and then he got that. <laughs> and this, is, this must be one of the longest fish caught in, in Europe uh, that year. So we are quite uh, happy with the, with the angling and it brings in a lot of money. Okay, so why, why do they actually fare so well? Well, we don't have salmon lice because we don't have salmon farming. We don't have dams anymore. We have lots of renewable energy in Denmark. You know, we cover about 70 to 80 percent of our power uh, from renewable energy, but it's all windmills, so we don't really use uh, hydropower at all. Uh, we don't have harvest on the coast or in estuaries at all anymore. Uh, there's a little bycatch with something, but it's very little. And we are lucky to not have these parasites. Uh, we don't seem to have much atrazine, and because our farmers cannot use that, at least. They use all kinds of other shit, but we don't know about that. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, the most important is that Kim and I are making a good management and honest and so on. So that's, that's down to us. But I was so humbled to put that last. Uh, but one thing we do have, of course, is predation. Because now we have, like, this is the little paradise. You know, everybody else would dream of this. They, they would think, boy, we have no dams and you have all that. You know, Martin has been over there looking at the rivers. They look like shit, actually. They're quite boring, you know, like on a field, just the canal. But, you know, we don't have the dams, so fish are doing really well, very productive. But what about the predation? Yeah, this is the snake in the paradise. Here's actually a little uh, photo of our hero here. He, he, he has a nice time here at a, at a sea trout uh, river outlet, and he just, you know, he, it's not a big flock of birds or anything, but he's just uh, happily eating those, uh, those smolts as they come out. So this is how it looks when you have uh, a nice little cormorant there. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of cute, I think, and not so bad. But of course, if you get more of them, it gets more problematic. So what did we do in the old days? We had 
uh, old studies. I didn't want to study cormorants. Nobody wanted. We are fish people. We want to study fish, you know. But every time we tagged fish, because we were much into telemetry already in the 90s, we ended up finding our tags in the cormorant colonies. So we were like, ah, we've got to do something with it. So we wanted to try to actually uh, quantify this very, very, very fine out here. So, so I tagged eels, salmon smalls, flounders, uh, and also tr trout smalls actually were tagged and released in Scan River. We use CV tags for, for, to try to use another meta method because, again, if you want to quantify these things, you need to combine a whole bunch of methods. It's not enough just to tag them with one thing and then go out, I think. So this is what we tried back then. Uh, we got very nice results of that. I had a very good student. He was out there collecting pellets every second day. He managed to get like 6,000 pellets. And out of those, we took subsamples every day and looked for otholiths too. And of course, scanned all the, sam all the pellets were scanned for the CV tags. So these coded via tags could be found in those. And that will give us uh, graphs like this. This is 2003. This is based on what we, what we find in the pellets. First collection was, was, was uh, first of uh, 15th of April. So this is April, May. And June comes here. So this is what you see. That's the daily estimated number of small seeds per day uh, from these pellets. So that's kind of neat. That, that shows very well at uh, this, this dome-shaped uh, small out migration. And this is, was just collecting that one colony in, in the estuary. So the, the, whole, the results from that estuary from the four years there was that we did telemetry in 2001 and uh, 2000, 2002. And we found 50% of the 40 to 50% of the tags were actually found in that one colony. The way to do that is that you have a data logger in the lower river, so you see what comes out of the river. So the ones that does not come out of the river but ends out in the colony, you know they've been eating in the river, and the ones that pass the data logger and end in the colony have been eating in, been eaten in the estuary. So that's pretty easy. And then basically you have a data logger on the colony with a, I have two this year, and we just equip them with solar panels, so they they are just out there. Uh, doing their job. I have a photo of one that I didn't bring, but where, where cormorants have been shitting so much on it, it's all white, so they're <laughs> probably trying to ruin our equipment, but it didn't work. <laughs> um, but that was the results from that. From coded wire tagging, we did that in two other years. We found that 25% of the available tag smalls were eaten during the three-week period. 40 to 50% of all the 10,000 tag deals were eaten in this first season, and all of the flounders were eaten in just two, two weeks. So, so you must imagine that is just in a huge, large, 300 square kilometer estuary that, that, that they were actually eating all the flounders so fast. And then we have the pellet analysis, just looking at otholiths, just totally traditional, old-fashioned biology, time-consuming, but can learn something about it. We found that 30,000 salmon smolts were eating 1.4 million flounders and 38,000 eels in that, that same year. So that makes up fine with what should be produced in this whole estuary and what used to be the basis of a fishery. Uh, nowadays, there's absolutely no fishery there at all, but they used to catch about 1,200 tons of flounder in that estuary uh, per year, uh, very proliferate uh, fishing. But they don't have that anymore. Well, there's other predators. I just wanted to sh throw this in somewhere. This is from a study we did in Norway. I was tired of tagging fish, and, and uh, Finn Oakland was drinking uh, cognac and playing his, uh, what the hell, harmonica or whatever it is. Yeah. So I, was, I went down to the coast and thought I would try to cast out my bait to catch some uh, safe and caught because I knew they were down there. And I was sitting right there on the edge where that sandbar is coming out. I was thinking so much about it when you talked about river bush because they have to cross this very shallow sandbar, the salmon smolts, and then go down in the deep. And I was there, and right as in the middle of the night, like when you turn a switch on, you heard these gulls going, Grrr! and then I was looking, and the water was clear. And, you know, even it was midnight, there was still sun up, uh, at least some light up there, and I could see these smolts come out in schools. We had the big fat hatchery smolts, small uh, wild salmon smolts, and big uh, trout smolts, all coming together in one school, out through the area, and immediately when they came out, the whole thing got started, and I caught 79 safe and caught on my gear just that, just one night. And then I looked in the bellies of them, and, and lo and behold, they were all filled with smolts. So, so if you were unlucky to have these kind of predators there, they would also hammer everything. We even, caught, we even found some of our Vemco tags in the that we have been tagging the day before in one of the predators. So, so they can, th these uh, things are also present. We don't have them much in Denmark these days, as I said. It seems that the cormorants and the seals cleaned up the coast very well for these type of predators. But, um, so, so I don't think that's a big issue for us, but it could be other places. 
Okay, then we went back to scan, oh, I I last year actually. Now we have fewer birds than 10 years ago, and we had this program now of harassing and shooting the birds out there, keeping them off the river. We have decided we don't want any cormorants principally in our rivers at all, so uh, you can always get permission to sh shoot and harass them. So now we wanted to see if the fewer birds and the harassing have helped uh, to reduce the, 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 the predation. So we did radio telemetry out there last year. I had 74 salmon uh, tagged. I had 75 tags, but one of them didn't work, just like Martin says. Uh, we lost eight in the river. Uh, some of them end up like this. But the remaining uh, we found in 17 of those in the common colonies. Problem here was that we had several colonies that year. It was supposed to be in their own goddamn colony, but these birds spread out, so they were in three different places. And I only had the data logger in one, so therefore my, my estimate is not as clear as it used to be, but this was the level we ended up with. 23 to 42% of the tax were taken by cormorants. Then we also did acoustic telemetry. Here's the Scan River, it's a small trap up here, another little small trap here, fish attacked, coming down, hydrophones just like you've seen, and then I have hydrophones out at the coast here too, at the sluice. So the, this is the estuary, Scan River comes in here, here's the one spot that's probably dangerous, and here's the other spot. So. So we were looking, but, and you see we have much less nest out here now. We only have five, six hundred uh, when we had two thousand before. So fewer, fewer, fewer birds in the, in, in the estuary. And then so we tagged these 104 salmon smolts with acoustic tags, and we had a net of 38% survival. So uh, it's very high mortality through this still. Wild smolts seem to have a higher survival than hatchery in this particular study, but that's not a, a pattern we can recognize. So my whole, uh, this presentation actually could be summarized in this one table here, because these are the studies we did. You can see I tried to write them up chronological here. Uh, we have used trout, hatchery, wild salmon, everything. Uh, the numbers tagged, the methods here, and we even have published quite a bit of this. So I took all these 20 st some studies and, and, and added them up, and we got an average lo small loss of 48%. Uh, throughout uh, the lower river and estuary migration. Uh, and these are mo mostly done in the west co coast uh, systems, but we have uh, some of the data also from, from the east coast. So for us, it seems to be a very, very standard pattern that we lose uh, over the years, so many. You can see there is a range, but it's, it's still very high, and, and of course it's, it's not satisfactory that we lose uh, so many of our precious fish uh, right there to the, to the predation. So where are they really vulnerable? Well, we know that because it's always when they transit from, from lotic to lentic waters, when they come from a river into a reservoir, into a dam, into just an impoundment, everywhere that the river slows down, the small start to become, they, they just become stupid. I mean, they, they mill around and they are in surface and everything that can eat something can eat them. I even seen foxes eating, <laughs> coming down and taking some smalls. Uh, so those are very dangerous places. Estuaries are dangerous, coasts are dangerous. And all these obstacles are extremely dangerous. We found 70% smalt loss at some stupid dams that were not even used for anything. I mean, all the water would come out. The only thing that happened was the smolts came in and they found that, oh, there's no current here. What do I do? And then they start milling around and then they got eaten. And there was no way, reason they should be lost, but they did. So, so all these little things are just, even just bridges. And there was also a guy talking about a culvert the other day and how, it, how just the shadow stops the fish. And my PhD from 99 was actually on all this the way that the pike were, were adapting to the smolts and going up in the river and actually sit, sitting right there in front of the bridge where the smolt will stop and then they will just eat them. So uh, the, the freer the river is, the better it is uh, as far as we see it. So now I'll change to this whole change of behavior that the cormorants started to get into our rivers. And uh, that is a new phenomenon. We didn't have that before. Here's from that salmon river where that fish on one meter and 41 was caught. And one of my friends were down there one morning and and you can see these birds just keep coming up and keep coming up and they all got fish in their mouth. And the only fish you have here is salmon and trout. So you can imagine how that river looks afterwards. This is not a normal sight to see because the birds are leaving as soon as you get there. But uh, we have seen quite a few of these uh, events. 
and uh, I'm not too happy to show it right here, right before lunch, but I guess it's okay. Uh, I took some of the worst pictures away that we have. So why, did, why do the birds suddenly start to go up in the rivers? We know they did that in Germany, Central Europe have been complaining. They lose their fish, they lose uh, all the grayling and stationary trout and so on in their rivers in Switzerland, Czech Republic, Austria, Germany. We never had that happen because our birds were nicely staying out in the coast where they should. But of course now the coast were basically empty from, from fish. Plus we had these two cold winters. All the fjords froze over, uh, the lakes froze over. So these few 15,000 or so birds that stayed in Denmark in the winter, they had to have some food. And they came into the put and take lakes, they came up to the rivers, they came everywhere. And we were hoping that when we get a mild winter, that they will return to their old behavior. But of course not, they kept going into the rivers all the time. Uh, and that's of course a problem. So one, th one good sign of this, an indication of this, is grayling. Here's uh, actually that year where it happened. This is the cold winter here. This is a standard uh, place to, to monitor grayling. So we have two kilometers of river that's been electrofished exactly the same time, same people, same way. And here you see what we normally will get, 412 fish, and in 2010, six. So it's basically an extinction of, 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 of the fish there. I was looking at grayling too, because that's a fish that is just disappearing now for our rivers. And we had lots of fly fishermen that like to catch the grayling. It's, they have been totally protected now for six years. And of course, it doesn't help because it's not fishermen that do anything to them at all. Nobody takes home and grayling, they catch them and release them. But this is what happened. They, they all get pretty much hammered by cormorants. Here is is an old study from Guinon where we have data way back from. Uh, right here was when the otter, fish otter started coming. So we had a decrease in population, but still a very nice population. These are juveniles and the other ones are a larger uh, grayling. And then the cormorants start coming in there, and you see, since then, we have had hardly any cormorant, uh, any grayling at all here. And it's exactly the same picture with brown trout. I had a student doing a little study here in a... In a that was a very il illustrative study, because he was looking at so only 25 grayling. That was really hard for us to find that many in that river. So we had a seven-kilometer stretch, totally unregulated, fantastic, natural, nice river. Nobody's fishing there. And we tacked these 25 in October, and they were doing great uh, until they came to February where it was cold. And then we had cameras up there. So we saw two or three or four, up to six cormorants being there for just a week. And after that, 80% of these fish were eaten, and 75% of the whole fish biomass of the river, because we did actually go through it. And when you look at the energetics and see how much do they eat per day, this 0.5 kilo, and we had seven kilometers of river with very few fish, it all added up very nicely in the end, and we are publishing this here now because this is, this is quite scary. And the most scary part is that the local people who live on the river, the fishing club and so on, says it cannot be cormorants here because we don't have them. That's why we looked in this river, because we thought it's got to be something else here. This is the one place where we don't have cormorants in Denmark. And we had very few, but it was enough to actually uh, make such a, a mess there. So. What we are looking on to, this is the salmon spawning run in the river Scan, the main river. And you see how well it went all the time. And we were expecting it to go at least up to 10,000. And then suddenly, you know, and this is probably an effect of in-river predation. That means that on top of eating those 50% of the smolt that we know they eat every year and that the salmon obviously could, could handle, uh, they also start now to feed on the Spawn, uh, hatchery uh, rearing areas, and, and we saw that they are really more empty now. There's much, much less salmon fry to be found in the river. Despite good spawning runs, uh, we get less and less, and this is attributed to definitely to predation. So the conclusion is that we have a significant impact on fish populations in both rivers, lakes, and on the coast. And that predation is basically uh, accepted to be the main regulating factors for many of our fish stocks. So we don't talk pollution anymore, we don't talk dams connectivity, we don't talk fishing, we don't talk agriculture so much. We really talk about uh, this predation. And the effects is, of course, economic loss and cultural loss because a lot of uh, all these coastal fishing villages and so on are just not there anymore. The biodiversity loss is critical. We have fish that are this North Sea houting that are indigenous to that one river is going extinct now because of uh, the cormorants. And of course, we had problems in reaching the requirements because we have a water frame directive requirement on fish saying 80 uh, juvenile fry, uh, 80 fry from salmon or, or, or trout per 100 square meters. And we can't reach that if, if nothing comes up to spawn. 
So is this only a problem in Denmark? And if so, why? I mean, we have a huge, uh, we have a high density, but for example, in Sweden, in, in southern Sweden, they have the exactly the same density. In Finland, they have the same density. In Germany, it's different because they don't have many breeding pairs. There's a winter thing there. Uh, and we know there's problems there, but, and I know, I mean, for Bush, River Bush, we saw that there was uh, indications that it could be a big problem, but I, I'm still not convinced that it's as bad your places, because you would you would have seen it, I'm sure, especially after doing small studies. But I was I was amazed to see and quite surprised to see the amount of studies starting up here now with uh, acoustic telemetry. And so so bear this in mind and uh, make sure that you look at at the comrades, even if they're not really there, they might they might play a play a role in this. So you probably ask about management. I can just tell you very briefly that we have this group that's been working for 20 years. We have a national comrade management plan since 97. Uh, the measures are basically X spraying of the X. If you spray them with paraffin oil, they die. Nothing comes out of them. The stupid birds keep just nesting on them the whole year and they don't get anything out of it. Uh, we can prevent new settlements. We do that, but it's kind of hard because if you deter them from going one place, they just go another. Then it's the shooting. It's not really hunting, but it's protective shooting that is initiated more and more. So those are the principal measures we have used. We try to make the management adaptive so that it changes. You have a framework here, but for example, when we saw the loss in pound nets, fishermen were permitted to shoot comrades around their nets within a kilometer. So that was actually a really nice measure when we still had 800 fishermen. Now that we only have a handful and they're so old they can't hit anything, they're also drunk most of the time. Uh, there's one guy who shoots about 1,000 a year and he's doing fine, but the rest can't shoot shit. So, uh, so this is not a good measure anymore. Then we lost uh, smalls, and we, we do, this is all in, interesting in, in the way of, of, of how does management work, at least in our country. Because we sit there by the table and everybody says, oh, no, no, the comrades are natural, we don't do anything. Then I, then I document this, it's scientific documentation, we publish it in a report or internationally, and we throw this report and bang, then we can do this, you know. And then next time we document, well, we lost smalls. They say, okay, then we are all happy with uh, letting the anglers shoot comrades in the small period. So everybody can get permission to do that now. Then we found out they started foraging the river, so now we also have protective shooting in the river in the winter time, and we even have possibilities to shoot and kill a lot of birds at the night roosting places if they're up by the river. So, in that sense, it's been a big success. The management boasts this as this is a good success because we have consensus, we have solved the conflicts, the conflicts are not ending up in a lot of frustration, people are more or less accepting this because all the stakeholders are on board. Problem is, it doesn't really help the fish because they still get eaten out there regardless. Here are some permissions granted to shoot in the rivers and you see uh, actually 45 clubs have now gained a possibility to go out and organize this. So the angling clubs can give permission to the hunt, local hunters and they can go and shoot all the birds they want. They have to register it but they can do it. They're not very good at it either. It's obviously quite hard to shoot these buggers in the winter. So, so I don't know how much that helped. Help. And here's, you see, that's the way you go out in the colonies. Oil the eggs, then they look like Easter eggs here, and nothing comes out of them. And this should be great. You saw we didn't want this colony. This is the colony in Rankeving Fjord, the big problematic colony that eats all our salmon, scan, scan salmon. And you saw, oh, we were spraying half of the eggs, then more on that, then almost all the eggs in many years here. And the co well, they, it went down to we were quite happy, and then bang, you know, it goes back up again. And, and, and now we have actually uh, this many nests again. So, so we think there's no really effect on, on this uh, egg oiling because new birds will just come in. As the old dies, new ones come, and, and they are very mobile. We got lots of birds settling here from Sweden and Norway and Finland too. Uh, so it's not the management measures really that seems to, to influence our numbers of cormorants, not at all. It's basically the cold winters and the lack of food. Uh, because they, they do die of starvation and they do show signs of not getting food enough because, as I said, the coastal areas are more or less uh, empty from fish. Uh, so what we have a situation now, I think, is that we have a bird here uh, has no conservation issue. There's 1.5 million cormorants in Europe, so there's kind of one of the most abundant birds. We don't have any recreational value, they don't have a commercial value, but they have a lot of feelings associated with it. The other side, we have us, the fishers, and I think we have better arguments now. We have a conservation argument, we have biodiversity, we have recreational, commercial, cultural fishery. Just that fishing in that, those one river here generates about two million pounds a year to the local community. And that's something that politicians seem to understand. So, 
So we are seeing a tendency that our scale is tipping now this way. Uh, but the problem is we need to have the other Nordic countries to help us because we can't deal with this ourselves. Because even if we uh, removed all the colonies in Denmark, we will still get these 20,000 birds from Sweden and Finland in the winter and they would still come in the rivers and they could easily empty all our rivers if that's what they really wanted. So that's not so well. Anyway, that was it for today. Thank you. <laughs>